It's Wednesday, September 23rd, and this is your Coffee Break on the HA Network. I'm Kate Chaplinski, bringing you all the headlines this morning, including soccer players in Ridgefield honoring a former teammate and an investigation into a Stanford home invasion. We'll also be bringing you Donald Ang's history report today, and Rob Adams will have some local sports. Later in this hour, we have an interview with some folks from Griffin Hospital on their program that aims to fight childhood obesity in the Valley. But first, on to this morning's news. For the second time in less than three weeks, Wilton police were involved in a car chase on Route 7. Last Thursday, September 17, Around 1 a.m., a driver of a stolen 2000 Honda CRV on Route 7 near Wolf Pit Road refused to stop after being sing- signaled for a non working taillight. The driver continued north at normal speeds with Wilton police in pursuit. Police ultimately deployed spike strips that deflated the two front tires of the vehicle. However, that didn't stop 38 year old Kareem Mayo of Shelton Avenue in New Haven, who drove an additional three to four miles after hitting the strips with police from three with three towns involved. The spike strips were set just north of the Four Seasons Racket Club on Danbury Road, but the chase came to an end near the Days Inn in Ridgefield on Ethan Allen Highway. It did not end cooperatively, according to police. Mayo ran from the stolen Honda and hid under a nearby car where he was immediately subdued. On his person, they found a crack pipe and he admitted to having been driving under the influence of crack and MDMA, also known as ecstasy. An inventory of the stolen vehicle later revealed small plastic bags that contained what police believed to be cocaine. It was also determined later that the Honda was stolen from Waterbury. The in-cruiser system Wilton police used to run the registrations plates was down at the time of pursuit. Mayo was charged with DUI, reckless driving, and out taillight larceny by possession in the third degree, interfering with officers and possession of narcotics and drug paraphernalia. He was given a bond of $10,000, which he was unable to post, and was arraigned in Norwalk Superior Court the same day. According to police officers from Ridgefield and Redding, helped in the pursuit. Less than a month earlier, a similar scenario played out on August 29th when 19-year-old Marlon Sumner Harris of Norwalk was arrested after evading police for 20 minutes up and down Route 7 and on other Wilton roads. Sumner Harris, however, saw the spike trips police deployed and stopped before his tires were punctured. Well, in other news, the police departments of Easton, Trumbull, Monroe, Darien, and Wilton agreed Tuesday to pay a settlement of $1.25 million to an Easton homeowner in what's been called the most blatant example of excessive force by police in the state. The Connecticut Post reports that faced with an almost certain decision that they would be found civilly liable in the case, the lawyers for the towns and their respective officers agreed to accept a recommendation offered by the U.S. District Judge Joan Margolis to settle the case. They said, we accepted the recommendation of the judge after significant negotiations. And uh, this brings a total of $4.75 million the towns have paid out for what the U.S. Second Circuit Court of Appeals called a botched SWAT-style raid. On May 18, 2008, 21 heavily armed officers from five area towns broke down the door of an Easton home based on a tip from a stripper and then threw in flash grenades and fatally shot a Norwalk man, 33-year-old Gonzalo Guzan, as he and the homeowner, Ronald Terabesi, were watching TV. The towns previously paid $3.5 million to Guzan's family, but had steadfastly refused to settle with Tara Bessie, and a trial was slated to begin next month in federal court in New Haven. It was seven years ago when then Easton Police Chief John Jack Solomon, under pressure, according to pretrial testimony from residents and a former first selectman, to rid a perceived blight from the neighborhood, called out the Southwest Regional Response Team. The team, made up of officers from five towns, was told that Tara Bessie was dangerous, that he had guns and drugs and had previously threatened to kill anyone who tried to harm his beloved pet, a large white bird. However, during the raid at Tara Bessie's Dogwood Drive home, Guzan was shot six times by a Monroe officer, Michael Sweeney. Police only found a small amount of drugs and no weapons. 
Well, Ryan Megan's memory was the biggest player on the field for the Ridgefield High Boys soccer during Tuesday's game at Tiger Hollow. Megan, who was 19 years old, was a member of Ridgefield's state co-champion squad in 2013 and one of the University of Connecticut students killed in a car accident last Friday near the UConn campus in stores where Megan was a sophomore. The Tigers dedicated Tuesday's game to Megan and registered their first victory of the season, beating Brian McMahon 3-0. According to their coach, we sensed in the air that there was an attitude of resolve that we might not have had over the first three games, and it's all because of Ryan, said Phil Bergen, who coached Megan at RHS. We want to finish off strong this season with a success story that we can contribute and honor Ryan with, so we look forward to that. As we said, Ryan was a sophomore at the University of Connecticut in stores. He was an education major and mentored to incoming freshmen, according to his family. He was also a member of the UConn club soccer and rugby teams. There is more on that game at the ridgefieldpress.com. Well, the Bridgeport Police Department over the weekend arrested a 24-year-old man who was allegedly wanted for drug dealing. On September 19th, around 4.30, a Bridgeport police officer was traveling south on Pequannock Street in a marked Bridgeport police squad car and recognized a suspect riding a bicycle in the same direction. The police officer recognized the suspect, Jose Ortiz, from a recent arrest and was aware that Ortiz currently had multiple warrants out. While following him, the police officer was spotted and accelerated and Ortiz accelerated away from the police vehicle. He turned into a parking lot of Save-A-Lot on Pequannock Street, then jumped off his bicycle and began to flee on foot. The officer exited his vehicle and pursued Ortiz on foot through the parking lot and over a chain link fence. A supporting officer traveling by foot to assist the pursuit found Ortiz curled in a fetal position between lovely nails and a red six-foot stockade fence that surrounded a separate trash dumpster. Following several attempts to get away from police officers, they were able to take Ortiz into custody with use of a taser. He was transported by ambulance to St. Vincent Hospital for minor injuries. He was charged with interfering with an officer, possession of narcotics, and possession with intent to sell. His bond was set at $50,000. Ortiz also had warrants out for failure to appear, other possession charges, and violating conditions of the, his release, unlawful restraint, assault, and threatening for a total bond of $170,000. Well, Stanford police arrested two men and are continuing to investigate a home invasion late Monday that sent one man to the hospital. According to police, two men knocked on the door of a house in Belltown area shortly after 11 o'clock Sunday, claiming that his car had been st struck. Police said the two men then began to beat the victim, pushing him in the house and continuing the assault. The victim grabbed the knife and stabbed one of the men, 32-year-old Joseph D'Onofrio, in the arm in what police said was an act of self-protection. The fight spilled back onto the front lawn and neighbors then called 911. Stanford police responding to the scene saw D'Onofrio running down the street. Officers chased him and took him into custody, taking him to Stanford Hospital for treatment. The second alleged attacker, 31-year-old Mitchell Polizo, was found hiding under a van in the backyard by officers at the scene. The victim was taken to Stanford Hospital and is being treated for multiple fractures of the face and skull. He is expected to survive his injuries, police said. Down the street from the incident, officers secured a vehicle that belonged to D'Onofrio, containing what they called many pieces of evidence linking both suspects to the crime. Both Polizzi and D'Onofrio were charged with home invasion, armed robbery, first-degree assault, and conspiracy. Bond was set at half a million dollars for each. And it's about time to throw it over to Rob Adams for a look at today's weather. Uh, the first official day of fall, Rob. It absolutely is, and it's a nice one out there. A sunny day, a high near 76. Tonight, clear, low 53, with a north wind around 5, so not too bad. Thursday, sunny, a high near 78 as we warm back up again. Thursday night, mostly clear, 54. To Friday we go, mostly sunny, high 71. Saturday, mostly sunny, high 71. All of us on the crew like the sound of that as we'll spend the day out at Greenwich High School. Sunday, mostly sunny, 71, staying very consistent. Then we go back up a little bit into Monday and Tuesday with highs near 74 and and 75. In Ridgefield, it's 68. Darien has 68 degrees, and Shelton drops just a notch down to 67 degrees on a very lovely day. Blue skies outside, Kate. All right. 
Thanks, Rob. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to have Donald Angs look back at this day in history. Rob's going to bring us some local sports news, and we have a lot more headlines after this. When you experience a sports injury, you want to get better and fast. Coastal Ortho Express gives you direct access to orthopedic care quickly. Their physicians are fellowship trained in sports medicine at world-class universities and are also team doctors for area football teams. For specialized personal care of sports injuries, go to Coastal Ortho Express. Open Monday through Saturday in the iPark building, 761 Main Avenue in Norwalk or CoastalOrthoExpress.com. Coastal Orthopedics, keeping you on the move. Carl Chevrolet is proud to sponsor HN Network's coverage of the area's best high school sports. No matter the sport, competition in the FCAC is spirited, so get out and cheer on your favorite team. If you can't make it to the game, be sure to bring HN Network with you to keep up with the action. Visit Carl Chevrolet in New Canaan or online at carldirect.com. While the temperatures are cooling down, the fall bite is heating up. Albies, Bonita, Blackfish, Alligator Blues, and Stripers are following the large schools of bait that are abundant in the Long Island Sound. If you love the New England coast during autumn, this is the time to be on the water. The latest from Shimano, Quantum, Avet, Hoagie, Phase 2, and more are in stock and ready to go at the dock shop. And don't mind those fall breezes with jackets, hats, gloves, and fleece from Grundens and Stormer. The dock shop will keep you warm and dry. Boater, beach bum, fisherman, or simply love the New England coast, this is a unique place to shop. The dock shop, now in two locations, 51 Tokenique Road, Darien, 609 Riverside Avenue, Westport, or on the web, dockshop.com. Back to school means back to busy, and Stewart's Market can save you precious time by stocking all of your favorite essentials under one roof. For a healthy start to school, we have all the ingredients. Walter Stewart's, your family-owned fresh local market, 229 Elm Street and at stewartsmarket.com. When you... Coffee break on the HAN Network. I'm Kate Chaplinski, and it's time now to throw it over to Donald Eng's look back on this day in history. It was the last performance of a musical icon, and it happened on this date. But first, we go to 1779. John Paul Jones, aboard the Bonhomme Richard, wins the Battle of Flambrohead. It is one of the most celebrated naval victories of the American War of Independence, despite its relative lack of of importance and considerable dispute over what actually happened. What we know is that with his ship sinking underneath him, Jones slumped over a chicken coop for a brief rest. The rumor circulated that he had been wounded. A British officer asked if he had struck his colors. Jones recalled yelling back, I have not yet thought of it, but I am determined to make you strike. An American officer reported hearing Jones say, I may sink, but I'll be damned if I strike. And British First Lieutenant Richard Dale, who saw Jones get back to his feet and draw his pistol, wrote in his report, that Jones replied he had not yet begun to fight. 1846, astronomers Urbain Jean Joseph Laverrier, Jean Couch Adams, and Johann Gottfried Galle collaborate on the discovery of the planet Neptune. The planet had long been mathematically theorized to exist. It was the furthest planet from the sun, then it wasn't, and now it is again. 1889, Nintendo Kapai later named the Nintendo Company Limited, is founded by Fusajiro Yamaguchi to produce and market the playing card game Hana Fuda. And finally, 1980, there was this. That, of course, the immortal Bob Marley playing what would be his last concert in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He had been diagnosed with a malignant melanoma four years earlier, but had declined to have his toe amputated, citing religious beliefs. Marley died on May 11, 1981, at Cedars of Lebanon Hospital in Miami at the age of 36. That's your look back in history, and I am Donald Ng. It was the last performance.
over now to Rob Adams for a look at local sports. Rob. Kate, good morning to you. Hi again, everyone. We start with field hockey. You saw it yesterday on the HAN Network as Darien shut out New Canaan 4-0. Freshman Katie Elders, the only freshman on the field, had a hat trick. Marissa Baker added a penalty shot for the Blue Wave. They improved to 4-0 on the year. Elsewhere on the scoreboard, it's from field hockey, Ward over Stamford 2-0. Norwalk beat Greenwich 2-0. To volleyball we go. Darien shut out McMahon 3-0 with Izzy Taylor having 13 kills, 6 aces, 2 blocks, and Kitty Crosby with 7 kills, 4 aces, and 17 service points. Staying in volleyball, Danbury top West Hill 3-2. Felicia Sepio had three aces, two digs, 16 kills, two blocks, 15 service points. She was absolutely a star on the court. It was Stanford over New Canaan 3-2. Lilsa Balas had 15 digs, 7 kills, 20 service points. The girls swimming and diving. New Canaan over Ludlow 99-78. Ridgefield 99, West Hill Stanford 82. Girls soccer. Uh, New Canaan all over Trinity Catholic, 6-0 with Madison Starr scoring twice. Braden Dial, Freya Mirendorf, Brooke Volpe, and Kylie Murphy all with New Canaan goals. Staples over Central, 6-0. Lydia Shaw had twos. Tia Zajek had two as well. Staying in field hockey, again, one more note from there. Staples over West Hill, 3-0. Chloe Devaney, Christine Taylor, Gabby Vega, each with goals for the Wreckers. Girls soccer, Trumbull over Ludlow, 1-0. Some more volleyball scores for you. Greenwich over St. Joe's, 3-1. Trumbull, 3. Staples, 1. Trinity Catholic took care of Norwalk, 3-1. Want the schedule? This is going to take a while. Hang on. Everybody grab a pen and a piece of paper. Here we go. Nothing on the schedule today due to the religious holidays. So everybody gets the day off, stay calm, and enjoy the day. So that'll do it for sports. And, of course, as we end sports, we take a moment and say farewell to Yogi Berra, the great Yankee legend dead at the age of 90 this morning. And really more than just a baseball legend, certainly an American icon. Back over to Kate with Sports. I'm Rob Adams. Kate, over to you. All right. Thanks, Rob. Well, Looking back at uh, today's news, a mother was arrested in Wilton after a police officer was sent to Avalon Wilton Apartment Complex on Friday, September 18th to check on the well-being of two young children who were reportedly unsupervised on the complex grounds. The officer saw them playing in a grassy area near the street and was told by neighbors that they had seen the mother get into her car and leave the premises. The children were eight and six years old. A Connecticut statute dictates that no child under the age of 12 should be left unsupervised in a place of public accommodation. When Lynn Vaccaro, who's 46 years old, returned, she explained that she had just gone to Walmart to shop. She was charged with leaving children unsupervised in a public place and released on a promise to appear at Norwalk Superior Court on September 28th. Well, in other news, as a state senator, Tony Wong is accustomed to delivering speeches in front of crowds, often with off-the-cuff remarks. On September 26th, he'll have to hope that ability to be quick on his feet transfers to the dance floor. Wong will be one of six community celebrities participating in A Chance to Dance, the debut fundraiser for Fairfield-based Inspire, Inc. Founded by Fairfield residents Nancy Billington and Lauren Lanham with the slogan, Change Your Mind, Inspire, Inc. strives to enhance the quality of life in the community by presenting educational programs that reduce stress and improve coping strategies. They are working with the Fairfield Public Schools, the Police Department, and the Senior Center with a growing roster of clients that includes businesses and other community nonprofits. They said, we ourselves are inspired by the overwhelmingly positive response we've gotten from the community, and we're incredibly appreciative of the support from Senator Wong and our other local celebrities and dancers who are generous giving their time and talents. A Chance to Dance is essentially a local version of ABC's hit show, Dancing with the Stars. It takes place this Saturday, September 26th at 6.30 at the Patterson Club Ballroom. While it's all about having fun and supporting a good cause, the pairs will also be competing for bragging rights. 
Well, the Connecticut Department of Consumer Protection Commissioner Jonathan Harris announced this week that there have been 19 applicants who met a recent deadline for submitting an application to open a medical marijuana dispensary facility under the state's medical marijuana program. Applications were in response to the department's June request for applications for proposed locations in New Haven or Fairfield counties. Harris said, we are pleased with the number of applications received and are ready to begin our comprehensive review process. Process. The department will begin a confidential application review process immediately. The review process will continue until license award determinations have been made. The state intends to award three dispensary facility licenses by early 2016. These license awards will then be publicly announced. Well, the Milford Board of Education is expected to take another look at which students should ride the bus and which should walk to school when it meets October 12th. In July, school board chairman Susan Glennon asked for consensus from board members as to whether or not they wanted to discuss school walking distances. Walking distances have drawn criticism from parents when the board decided to more strictly enforce those walking distances and take students off the bus who had been riding. At that time, several board members were focused on cutting transportation dollars to make room for what they saw as more direct education spending. The efforts did cut costs. Chief Operations Officer James Ricciatelli Jr. said the schools have saved more than $165,000 per year over the last two years on those transportation reductions. Although half the board members did not want to revisit the walking distance issue when Glennon brought it up, after a brief discussion, the board asked the administration to provide a report on the number of students who would be affected and the cost associated with making changes under two different scenarios. Scenario one would be based on reducing the high school walking distance from two miles to one and a half miles, reducing middle school from one and a half to one mile, and leaving elementary schools as they are at a one mile walking distance. Scenario two will be based on reducing the high school walking distance from two to one and a half, leaving the middle school at one and a half miles, and leaving the elementary school at one mile. But there's a lot more on that story at milfordmirror.com. Going to throw it back to Rob Adams for another look at today's beautiful weather. Rob? All right, Kate. Thank you very much. Beautiful day indeed outside. Sunny in 76 will be our high. Clear in 53 tonight. Sunny in 78 for tomorrow. To Thursday night we go. Mostly clear. A low 54. Friday sunny and a high near 71. Partly cloudy Friday night. The low around 53. To Saturday when we're at Greenwich, of course, because we've got soccer Thursday, football Saturday. Mostly sunny in 70. 71, partly cloudy, 53 Saturday night, 71 and sunny on Sunday, 74 and sunny on Monday. We can even look to Tuesday, mostly sunny, a high near 75. 67 in Shelton, Ridgefield has 68. Darien also 68 degrees. Kate, back over to you. All right, thanks, Rob. Well, we're going to take another quick break, and we're going to bring you some more news when we come back and get ready for a special interview with some folks from Griffin Hospital who are fighting childhood obesity in the Valley Schools. That and a lot more coming up after this. Does buying a car leave you feeling like you're chasing your tail? Head straight to Pamby Chrysler Jeep Dodge and Ram and take car buying in a whole new direction. Football University, the nation's leading football training experience, is now accepting applications for its 2015 camps. Our elite faculty of NFL coaches and top professionals teach position-specific on the field and in the classroom to improve your football IQ and help you reach your full potential as a player. Apply today at footballuniversity.org. Football University, where technique plus talent beats talent alone. High Cut Rockefeller Estate is Westchester County's top cultural attraction and is now open for the season. Don't miss out. Go online to HudsonValley.org to plan your visit. Take a drive out to beautiful Sleepy Hollow, New York and enjoy High Cut's stunning architecture, breathtaking gardens, expansive art galleries, and commanding Hudson River views. From world-class art by Picasso and Warhol to expertly tended gardens, there's something for everyone. High Cut Rockefeller Estate, a national trust for historic preservation landmark.
does buying a car leave you? And we're back with more of this Wednesday edition of your Coffee Break. I'm Kate Chaplinski. And getting back to some of the news around the area this morning, the legendary Smokey Robinson, whose recognizable singing, songwriting, and producing propelled him to success in the music industry for more than 50 years, will headline the Ridgefield Playhouse's 15th anniversary gala coming up Saturday, October 10th. Robinson attained the kind of success few others can claim. His influence as a recording artist and song songwriting artist is recognized by a string of hits he was responsible for as a member of the Miracles, including Shop Around, You've Really Got a Hold on Me, I Second That Emotion, and a lot more. So for more information on how to get tickets for that event, you can call 203-438-5795 or go to ridgefieldplayhouse.org. Well, coming up this weekend, the public is invited to take a trip back in time on Saturday, September 26th, when the iconic Little Red Schoolhouse in New Canaan opens its doors from 1.15 to 3.15 in the afternoon. The Carter Street treasure, located a stone's throw away from the Kelly family home, was built in 1868 and was Connecticut's last operational one-room schoolhouse when it closed in 1957. Docents who were students of the longtime headmistress, Miss Mary Kelly, will lead the tours. Educated there in the 1890s, Miss Kelly taught at the schoolhouse for 47 years until its closing. Acquired by the Historical Society in 2003, it was subsequently restored with the help of society members, nonprofit groups, students, and friends. Two exhibits currently on view at the Historical Society will run through next week, including a collection of cashmere shawls occupying the Costume Museum the shawls shown reflect the preferences of Americans during the Victorian period and were generous donations from past and present members. So there's a lot more information on that at ncadvertiser.com. And of course, in some interesting news today, none of the companies that have collected royalties on the Happy Birthday song, yes, the Happy Birthday song, for the past 80 years held a valid copyright claim to one of the most popular songs in history. Rob Adams is playing a piece of it right now. Believe it or not, this song was copyrighted for 80 years. And we can play it legally now. Yeah, and we can play it and we can't get in trouble. And that's according to a federal judge in Los Angeles. That was a ruling on Tuesday. It was a stunning reversal of decades of copyright claims. The judge ruled that the owners of that, Warner Chapel, never had the right to charge for the use of Happy Birthday to You. Warner had been enforcing a copyright since 1988 when it bought it from Birch Tree Group, the successor to Clayton F. Sumney Company, which claimed the original disputed copyright. Judge George H. King ruled that a copyright filed by Summy in 1935 granted only rights to specific piano arrangements of the music, not the actual song. The copyright had been applied to movie makers, restaurants, greeting card companies, among others. So that's your fun fact for today. We're going to wrap up this news portion of your coffee break, but stay tuned because we're going to be talking with some folks from Griffin Hospital about their Vitals program, which goes into area schools and is trying to fight childhood obesity. So that's coming up right after this. Have no fear, Hersam Acorn's Fast Frights Movie Contest is here. Can your film make the cut? Submit your original three-minute horror movie today. Visit FastFrights.com for more details. The fall bite is heating up. 
Albies, Bonita, Blackfish, Alligator Blues, and Stripers are following the large schools of bait in the Long Island Sound. This is the time to visit the New England coast, and the Dock Shop can get you outfitted with the latest fishing gear, jackets, hats, gloves, and fleece. Boater, Beach Bomb, Fishermen simply love the New England coast. This is a unique place to shop. The Dock Shop, now in two locations, 51 Tokenique Road, Darien, 609 Riverside Avenue, Westport, or on the web, dockshop.com. Alliance. We are an industry leader in coordinating transportation for large events such as corporate road shows, conferences, and special events. Our team of experts understands the dynamics and logistics of high-pressure situations and complex arrangements, all within a rapidly changing environment. Since 1999, we have added charter jets, event management, and personal protection to our range of services. Mention this ad for $25 off your next round-trip reservation. Alliance and you. Together, we can achieve the extraordinary. 855-546-6996 or AllianceLimo.com. Tired of all the bull? Relax and enjoy the experience of buying a car at Pamby Chrysler Jeep Dodge and Ram. No bull allowed. I'm Kate Chaplinski, and we're here with some folks from Griffin Hospital who are part of the Vitals program there. Gina Smith, who is a Vitals coordinator, and Ruth Lazenby, who is a working member from the Massaro Community Farm. Ladies, welcome. Thanks for having us. Um, Just ask, just talking to the mics there, sorry. And Gina, first, just tell me a little bit about what Vitals is. Vitals is a partnership uh, between Griffin Hospital, the Yale Griffin Prevention Research Center, and four local school districts. Uh, and Sonia Derby, Shelton, and Seymour. And we were founded around 2010, where uh, Griffin Hospital and the Yale Griffin Prevention Research Center reached out to the community and different uh, school districts just to see you know, who was interested in partnering to fight childhood obesity. And these four school districts have been with us since the beginning, and we started programming in 2011. And what we work to do is to work with the schools to integrate programs into their existing school structure, so it's not anything in addition to what they're already doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, We don't want to burden the teachers. They're already overburdened. So what programs could be brought into the schools um, that can work along with what they're already doing in the classrooms and in the form of nutrition and physical activity? So we're trying to just provide more opportunities for children to get up and moving and learn more about healthy eating. Right. Now, I know uh, I used to be Shelton Herald editor, and I remember Mm -hmm. kind of when Vitals got underway, and there was a lot of talk about, you know, just maybe having students stand up in the middle of the day, do some movements, do some exercises, Mm -hmm. and you have specific programs like Healthy Cooking, Nutrition Detectives, ABCs. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about some of those those programs? Sure. So when we started, we we knew we couldn't tackle every school at once. So we started with elementary schools because we already had two programs developed. One is that ABC for Fitness Mm -hmm. program, and that's where students do get up and move in the classroom. Just such a great idea. Simple thing, but great idea. And it also, it helps just kind of refocus their attention and get them ready to learn. And so the idea is quick activity breaks, three to five minutes long, a couple times a day to try to add 30 additional minutes of exercise per day. Um, So we have manuals for the teachers. We help give them great resources of different activities that they can use. Mm -hmm. Nutrition Detectives is another program that we have. That's our nutrition program from elementary school students. It helps them learn how to see um, what to look for on the front of a package and what is not always true. And so right. when it says it's healthy, you know, you really have to look at the nutrition label and you have to look at that ingredient list. Mm-hmm. Kind of gives them those clues as to what to look for to make sure a product is healthy. And so we started there and then we've been branching out a little bit. We now have a program that's kind of similar that, to the Nutrition Detectives program uh, for middle school students now called Your Road to Health. So we're trying to slowly get our way into high schools as well. And so other things that we're doing with older students are like gardens. And that's kind of brings in our partnership with Massaro and um, wellness clubs for high school students is another thing that we've started recently. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. And now, Ruth, we want to bring you in. Tell us a little bit about the Massaro Community Farm. Sure. Yeah, so Massaro has been around for about five years now. It was um, sort of a defunct dairy farm that the property was left to the community of Woodbridge. And they decided that they wanted to... 
um, keep it keep the land in farming and um, to create this community farm where people could learn about healthy food and um, there's a functioning CSA there. So my role um, is a little bit different. So I'm actually I'm a food corps service member and food corps is a national um, part of the AmeriCorps network and we place uh, emerging leaders and communities all over the country to work on these exact issues. So um, nutrition, school gardens, and working with school food more generally. Um, so I sort of do a mix of this nutrition-based work. Some I do a little bit with nutrition detectives in the elementary schools in Ansonia, and then, um, but but the bulk of my work really is the school gardens. So I um, am sort of a resource for school gardens within the community. I work specifically in Ansonia, mostly at um, the two elementary schools and at Ansonia Middle School. Um, so it can be everything from working to get grants uh, or physical resources for the gardens and vitals has been super generous and um, a great resource for the valley in general in school gardens um, to also like last year I ran a training a workshop series for teachers so how can you connect the school garden to the curriculum and how can they um, match activities in the gardens to the standards that they're already working on um, so this sort of thing, trying to think a little bit more broadly. Often right. people think of school gardens as just science, but you can hook it into math and art and reading and writing and social studies. So um, helping sort of uh, provide resources and training for that is, is right. a big part of what I do too. And teaching students how to grow their own food is kind of like a vital life lesson that mm. vitals, you know, <laughs> playing on that. But it really is. And it's interesting that, you know, maybe for many years that wasn't happening. I mean, how many schools now are, have started these gardens? Gosh, Any I idea? Think we're in the valley. <laughs> At least three of our districts yeah. do have several right. um, and they're growing um, each year. And we've seen some really great things come out of them. Each school is doing their own thing with them. Some of them have started garden clubs after school. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, some of them are trying to bring it into several different classes, like Ruth just said, you could do science, you could do math, and also it gets them out of their chair, and it's right, also it's physical some, activity. Yeah. And they're also, some of them have kitchens where they can bring the food in and prepare food from what they've grown and try it, probably exposing them to vegetables or fruits that they haven't tried before. So we've seen some really great things come out of the school gardens, and Ruth has been a really great help being a good resource. And it, yeah, we really find that kids are so much more likely to try fruits and vegetables and mm -hmm. to like them if they've grown them mm. themselves. It's right. like they're a little That's more invested. Yeah. Um, yeah. That so it's and it sort of takes a different form at every school. You know, some schools, like Gina said, have after school clubs, and that's sort of the the core of the garden work. And some, it's very integrated into the science curriculum. It sort of depends, and it looks a little bit different at at every school mm -hmm. and every community depending on their needs. Now, you probably both can answer this, but how have parents reacted? Have they been learning a lot from this program? Gina, what well, do you actually think? actually just starting to reach out to parents more. We've really been focused on the schools mm -hmm. lately, um, but over the past year, we've started sending out monthly newsletters with healthy recipes and tips to get you know your kids up and moving as a family. What can you do on the weekends? But now our sort of future plans include more of the parent and community outreach. So we really want to work more with parents and then to the community, the four communities that our schools are in. Um, so future plans sort of include cooking classes for parents and children. So that's sort of one thing that we want to try to tackle first. We think that might be a really great way to teach nutrition, but also have a hands-on kind of like the gardens are a hands-on component. Um, we've been doing a cooking contest with students for the past two years, and we've noticed that kids really enjoy cooking and they get really excited about it and so we hope that having sort of um, classes where they can come with their parents and learn how to cook and learn about nutritious meals that that would be our, a good next step so that is something that we are planning on doing a little bit more of. Well a program like this obviously needs a lot of community support and you know it's not free so I mean how can people like get involved or help you know and just be part of it? So um, probably the quickest, we are on Facebook. We are on the griffinhealth.org website, but also our number, if anybody had any interest in speaking with me directly and learning more about what we do, or 203-732-1265. And I'm at extension 305. And you know, I think that kind of if you have a child in one of these school districts, kind of be on the lookout for our newsletters. A lot of the districts have our newsletter up on their school website. Mm -hmm. That's one way that they distribute it out to the parents. Um, and just contact us and we will be reaching out to parents more and there will be start to be more, more opportunities for parents to get more involved with what we're doing. That's 
Great. And just curious, do we see the tide shifting? I mean, childhood obesity, we've been talking about it for years now, and it's a growing epidemic. Do we see, do you guys see things changing at least on this community level? I think it's going to take some time, but right. I do think that we we have grown. Our list of partners is growing. We have some really great community partners involved. We have the Valley YMCA, the Naugatuck Valley Health District, ShopRite. Um, recently hired a registered dietitian for the area that's going to come on board and help us out with some programming. So we really have some great partners. I think we've grown a lot, mm -hmm. and I think that hopefully as we build our program list and are able to get out into the schools more and in the community more, we'll start to see some things shift. It's going to take definitely more than one or two programs. It's going to be several layers of programs that help to at least raise yeah. awareness. There are a lot of big system-wide causes of, of this mm -hmm. problem, so it's definitely a long-term right. project. But I will say that at my at the first staff meeting at Prendergast Elementary School this year, um, Principal Apicella said he has seen a change in the kids' attitudes, so that's unscientific, but um, an important <laughs> <still> testimonial. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and Ruth, how can people find out about the Masaro yeah. Community Farm? Um, so MasaroFarm.org is the website, and I would recommend you um, check it out. There are a lot of um, different programs that are free and open to the public. Um, just in a couple weeks, on October 3rd, we have our annual Family Fun Day. Um, from 1 to 5 p.m. at the farm, so totally free, open to everyone. Um, there will be lots of activities for kids. Um, we also have a nature trail that is free and open to the public every day um, between sunrise and sunset. So I, told, I really encourage people to come stop by. Um, a couple times a month we do an open farm day when we invite families to come to our learning garden which is smaller and really just designed as an educational garden it's separate from the rest of the farm and we invite people in and we you know we're always working on different things there and have different activities going on so um, yeah that's a big part of what I'm doing also sort of helping build the community around the farm beyond the town of Woodbridge because that's how it started um, the farm is in Woodbridge but we're really trying to build a lot more connections with the greater valley community so. that's great all right well ladies thanks so much for joining me i mean you guys are doing great work so we appreciate you coming in and telling us about it thank you thank you so much for having us all right well that's going to do it for this coffee break extra encourage everyone to find out more about the vitals program through griffin hospital that's going to do it i'm kate chaplinski i'll be back tomorrow at 11 with your coffee break